I'm David Smith, and this is my wife, Linda. Uh, we live here in Little Rock for uh, since 74, and we've been married for 50 years. We have three children. We have 10 grandchildren. We've been here a lot of years. And when Jonathan asked me to do this, I have to admit, I love giving gifts, but I was afraid my friends would go, please don't encourage her to give us those homemade 90% off gifts. But a few years ago, giving to others changed for me, okay? First of all, I married David. That changed. And number two, I read some books, The Hole in the Gospel and Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, and that changed me. And then Luke brought something home from Haiti one time, this little toy of a little child in Haiti that he just picked up paper and twigs and made a toy. And then I watched Schindler's List, and I realized that the saddest part of that whole movie was that last scene where he's looked at his ring, and he looked at that shiny car, and he said, I could have saved one more. I think deep inside, we all want our heart to break with the things that break God's heart and the things that Jesus says gives us great joy. And so I realized that the way I live and the way I spend money makes a difference in other people's lives. I'm sorry, I'll probably keep giving you those homemade gifts, but I hope the more and more I want to be like Jesus, the more and more joy I'll find in living simply so that others can simply live. One of the things that I grew up never having met a missionary, and I began to think about, well, how are my kids going to be able to live as a missionary? Um, we were in a private school, and the kids were beginning to mirror the other clothes that other people wore and want to go on the vacations that other people went. So I'll be very truthful. You know, one of my first trips was, uh, first of all, to get it out of my system, but then also to think about how I could influence my kids. Uh, sometimes I used to say, Daddy, I thought we were broke all the time. So we might have overdone it a little bit. But if you're in West Little Rock, uh, how are you going to create a, a world that you feel like they can grow up with a servant mindset? And it's a challenge. And so after my trip to Haiti, I thought, well, I'm going to at least introduce them to the joy of, of being over there and serving and, and being with people and, and making them friends. Well, I didn't like it when David went to Haiti. I just thought it was wrong. There were people here that we needed to help. And why do you have to go to another country? And then I realized... After the kids went for years and years and years, they actually felt like that was the best vacation they ever had because it was like such an incredible joy compared to a last, just a, a temporary joy. And then um, they started doing the same kind of thing in their life. It's like, you know, having a nonprofit so that they can help other people. You know, I have found that I've had joy in giving things away because you can see people who've been hungry have food on the table. You can see people who have never had a job be able to work. Uh, you can see so many things empowered, and that truly tends to bring you a lot more joy than dying wealthy. Amen, darling. <laughs> so I want to let you know it was really hard to get them to share that with you because they don't want to be broadcasting like we really... Uh, you know, this is a real big deal to us because of Jesus' thing about giving in secret. But I also thought it would be encouraging for us to hear from one another about what kind of life comes from these kinds of disciplines. So, uh, I'll follow suit. One of the things Leslie and I do when we give, on, when we tithe on a regular basis, one of the things we do is we tell our kids not how much the check is that they're putting in. We, we give, we write the check out, we give it to one of our kids to put in the collection basket, and then we make sure and we tell all our kids what we could have bought instead. So it's things like, you could buy a few American Girl dolls with this, but instead we're going to give it to church because we're entrusting our riches to God who has entrusted this to us in the first place. And I don't know if that's a good idea or if it's going to land them on some therapist's couch in the future, but the goal is to help them participate in what God is inviting us into and find the joy in inviting it. So we're, we're in a series that we're concluding today called More, where we're looking at what Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, specifically about money. And if you've missed the last few weeks, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast, because every Sunday kind of built on the other. But today is the day, like if you, if you only heard one, 
this would be it. Because no matter, if you gave regularly on a regular basis, if you, you know, were super generous, but you missed this one bit of it, I think you'd miss all of it. You'd, you'd miss the real heart behind what Jesus is trying to get at. And I believe in this so much that when the former preacher, my friend Chuck, invited me to preach here a few years ago, even though I had no skin in the game, this was not the local church I lived at, I offered to preach this story that we're going to talk about today. Because I believe in this so much. Not because I think Jesus is trying to get your money. But again, because Jesus wants to make sure our money doesn't get us. And God has a very different outlook on our stuff. He looks at things differently than you do. It's not enough for you just to muster up and dig deep and pull out your wallet and grudgingly give. God has bigger dreams for you and your finances. And in order to um, get at what I think Jesus really wants for every one of us, I'm going to go to one of the most uh, well-known stories in the Gospels. However, it is one of those stories that every time you hear someone like me talk about it, they spend most of their time talking about why you don't need to pay that much attention to it. It's the story of the rich young ruler. But um, first, I'd like to start off with prayer. So let's bow. God, as we uh, talk today about this story that is familiar for a lot of us, would you open up our hearts so we can hear it again with fresh ears? Holy Spirit, would you do the work that you need to do in our lives? Would you fill the gap between the things that I say and what people hear? Would you convict those of us who need to be convicted? And would you spur us on to a life of great, great joy? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Richard Stearns was the CEO of a fine dining silverware company in the Northeast. He was doing very, very well in life. He uh, <clears throat> lived in the Northeast in a 10-bedroom mansion for him and his wife and his, uh, a couple of kids. He drove a Jaguar XST. He had a uh, dream life. His kids went to this posh private school. He, he had everything you could want materially. And he was a good dude. Richard Stearns went to church. He served on the missions committee. He actually spoke at mission fundraisers. And because he did that so often, it got him on the short list with World Vision, which is a nonprofit that is committed to ending um, systemic poverty, that, uh, worldwide poverty in Jesus' name. They knew about Richard Stearns. They knew of his capable leadership. And so they called him and said, Would you like to be considered to become our next CEO, our next president at World Vision. And then they told him the salary, and it was just a fraction, I mean a portion of what he was currently making. He would have to leave his mansion, sell his car, move his kids across the country. He would have to give all of that up. And so Richard Stern said what most of us would say. He said no. And that's a bit like today's story. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, starting in uh, verse 18. We're going to start in verse, uh, or chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 17. Jesus actually says, he starts off this whole section by saying, the one, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it, which is a really important thing for you to remember as you hear this story. You don't earn the kingdom of God. You don't buy the kingdom of God. You don't, children don't have much to bring to the table. But Jesus is saying, you receive the kingdom of God like a child. A certain ruler came to him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness. Or honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you lack, which is not a word I think this man had heard very often. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said, We've left all we have to follow you. 
Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Now, a couple of observations here. When the rich man comes to Jesus and asks uh, uh, about eternal life, he is not asking the question you think he is. You think he's asking, how do I get into heaven after I die? There's a word he could have used to uh, talk about that. That is not the word that he uses. He, uh, see, Jewish people were waiting on God to act decisively um, to change the world and change everything. So they divided the world up into two segments. The age to come, this age, and then the age to come, which is what Jesus is referring to um, at the very end of this passage. And the rich young ruler is saying, how can I be a part of that? Uh, what the Jewish people would call tikkun olam, the healing of the world, um, the, the, uh, the age to come. Basically, that's, that's, he, he's asking about how can I have the really bad, the good kind of life. And that's what Jesus refers to right after that when he's unpacking this conversation with the disciples. Eternal life and the age to come are this idea of a good kind of life that lasts forever. And he says, no one, Jesus, as he ends this little section, says, no one who has left things for the kingdom of God will be failed to be rewarded in the age to come. And the guy, another observation, the guy who comes to him isn't a bad guy. We would like this guy. He's kept the commandments, right? He, he's, we would make him a deacon or an elder. And he asks Jesus an honest question, and Jesus gives him an honor, honest uh, response. He starts off by saying what any Jewish rabbi would have said in the first century. How can I be a part of the next thing God is doing? How can I be a part of the age to come? And Jesus says, keep the Torah, keep the Ten Commandments. But notice, Jesus leaves the first two out. Now, these people have the, um, the Torah, the, the, what we call the Old Testament today, they have this down. They have it memorized the way uh, some of you have movies memorized. And so for Jesus to leave the first two commandments out would have stood out to everybody listening. It would have been like me saying, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my... Yeah, you can't let it sit there, can you? They would have known, like, hey, there, you, there's a gap there. He's highlighting the first two commandments. Anybody remember what the first two commandments are? You shall have no other gods before me. He's highlighting the commandments of idolatry. Now, why is Jesus trying to draw to the surface for this guy who is very rich the commandment about don't have any gods before me? Um, did you know that the first banks were temples? Did you know that? The first banks were uh, temples. That I, I, don't, I don't think, you can Google that if you want to, but I don't think you have to. Because you can probably understand why. The human impulse is, if money gives you some kind of security, then let's worship it. And you, you know, you wouldn't bow down to your checkbook, but it is really easy to make this an idol. Did you know that malls today, Park Plaza Mall, and malls all across the country and really even the world, are built on the architecture of medieval cathedrals? Because they are the most religious place in town. Malls are the most religious place. There's one theologian that I really like a lot, uh, Jamie Smith, who talks about how the mall being is this incredibly religious site, not because it's preaching a message or some kind of doctrine. Nobody meets you at the door of the mall and gives you their 15 statements of belief because the mall doesn't believe anything. Its targets are lower. But don't think that means the mall is a neutral site. The mall is trying to... It, it's it's um, The Victoria's Secret is that she wants your heart. The mall is actually very religious. Everywhere you go, and you heard this in the Smith's kind of testimony video, how do you raise your kids in West Little Rock? Where there's all these things that are kind of competing for our allegiance and our heart and our joy. Not that there's anything wrong with like shopping at the mall. It's not. Just be aware of it. This is why Jesus, like in Luke 12, He says, watch out. Be on your guard. That word, watch out, be on your guard. He says that seven other times in the Gospel of Luke, and every other time, it is when he's talking about false teachers who are trying to tell you, you can get saved by your works, you can get saved by your self-righteousness. He's saying, watch out. Money is a false teacher just like those Pharisees are. Be on your guard. A person's life does not consist of an abundance of their possessions. Why does Jesus say, watch out? Why doesn't He say, watch out about other sins? Why does He you know? Watch out, don't commit adultery. 
Well, nobody commits adultery, by, you know, slowly slipping into it, right? You're never like, wait a second, you're not my wife. But money, money can slowly sneak up on us. And Jesus is trying to point out to it, it's a false teacher. It is discipling our soul in certain ways. And if you're not attentive to what it's teaching you, you won't like where it leads you. There is a reason Jesus talks about money almost more than anything else. The only thing Jesus talks about more than money is the kingdom of God. He talks more about money than he talks about heaven or about hell. And it's not because he's trying to get your money. He's not, he's not looking for people to bankroll him. It's because he knows the power money has over us and how deceitful it can be. Okay, so for this next part, I need a volunteer. Who has an iPhone here? Oh, come on. <laughs> Look at you. I'm talking to the Amish all of a sudden. <laughs> okay, who's got an iPhone? Just show your hands. Who has an iPhone that they would be willing to let me borrow? Hands start going down. Okay, Madison, I, I know you well enough to do this. Okay, so this is an iPhone like 6, 5. So not waterproof, which is important. <laughs> because uh, hopefully our friendship will survive this, Madison. Okay, so whenever you think of money, you think of it in terms of security, but you're putting your security in, in stuff. And remember what Jesus says? Moth and rust and vermin and thieves. So what if I took Madison's iPhone and just started letting you see what money does to your heart? Oh! Just kidding, it's a broken iPhone. It was totally set up from the beginning. <laughs> but you see what, ha what happened inside your heart when you saw that, right? Wasn't there something inside of you that was like, what's that worth, a couple hundred bucks? What? Think about what I could do with that. You became like a character in the Lord of the Rings as soon as you saw this happening. With that power, I could do some great things. Because money is deceitful. It, it makes promises it cannot keep. Is there anything in your life that causes you to stress as much as money? That causes you to worry as much as money? That is, it makes our relationships get destroyed quicker? I mean, why do you not loan money to friends and family? Because it hurts the relationship, right? And for me, the amazing thing is not the pull money has on us, the way the destructive power it can have on our relationships in our life, the amazing thing is that we don't ever see it. This is why Jesus says, watch out. We don't realize how much we're bending our knee to this God already. We don't realize how disproportional the anxiety that we have is. But there is more, this is what Jesus wants us to know, there is more at stake than just paper and metal. It is a principality and power that is fighting for your heart and soul. Do you ever wonder why people who are in the grip of greed can't see it and you can see it in them? But they can't see it in the mirror? Well, here's the way, the way it works. Let's say you get a raise. Let's say you get a substantial raise. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you, your ship has come in. You've got it made. You won't need anything again for a long time, right? But here's what you do. You move into another socioeconomic bracket. And so you start comparing yourself to people in a new socioeconomic bracket. And have you ever noticed you don't compare yourself to the people below you in another socioeconomic bracket? You compare yourself to the people who have just a little bit more than you? You move into a neighborhood that's different. You all of a sudden are living around people who drive nicer cars than you do again. And you don't compare yourself to the rest of the world. You compare yourself to the people you hang out with now. The human heart always wants to justify itself. Sin, I, one of my problems with church people is that we have such a small view of sin. We think, you know, sin means don't drink or cuss or, you know, whatever. And those are great things. Those are great boundary markers. But come on, sin is a lot deeper than that. The human heart loves to justify itself. And this is one of the easiest ways we do it when it comes to money. We say things like, I don't live like they do. My means are so modest compared to theirs. That's why Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. Be on your guard, because this way of life, a, a person's life, the kind of joy, the kind of life you really want, does not consist from the abundance of your possessions. Did you know that in the Bible there are 500 verses about prayer? There are 500 verses about faith. There are 2,000 about money. 
Jesus, when he does his 38 parables, 16 of them are about finances. And Jesus knows how easy it is for this to uh, corrupt our lives. So he tells the man to sell everything he's got and follow him. And the man, this is not what he expected to hear, right? I mean, he asked to be a part of this new thing Jesus is doing. He wants to be a part of the age to come. And Jesus is like, I got one word for you. eBay. And so he leaves. He walks away. Because this is at the heart of it. And I think it's one of the hardest parts of following Jesus. Because in every other area, it's all theoretical, isn't it? You can say, man, i got to pray more. Man, i got to have more faith. i got to make God more of a priority. But Jesus cuts to the quick with this guy. He's cutting the quick this morning with us. Because you can look on your bank account and see how well we're doing with this. I mean, you know, you can almost hear the rich young ruler be like, hey, Jesus... What about all the you know, birds of the air and lilies of the field? Why can't you get back to saying stuff like that? But as soon as he hears the exact dollar amount it's going to take for following Jesus, he walks away. Because he hears how much it costs. And it's a bit too much. But, does the guy ever realize Jesus isn't asking him to do anything he hasn't already done himself? I mean, Jesus is God in the flesh. He is not impressed by the camel this guy rode up on. He's God in the flesh. <clears throat> and there's, <clears throat> there's no way this guy can understand <clears throat> <clears throat> how much Jesus gave up just to have this conversation. I mean, through Him all things were made. Jupiter is His footstool. And yet, this rich young ruler doesn't want to go along with what Jesus has already done in his own life and what he's headed to. In the Gospel of Luke, there's a turning point we'll talk about in a few weeks in Luke 9 where it says Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Anybody know what is in Jerusalem? The cross. This guy is coming up asking to follow him and Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's changed. He is headed somewhere that is going to change the course of human history, but it is going to cost him everything. See, it's fun to watch testimony videos about people being generous, but on the other side of that, everybody knows there's a part of generosity that is a sacrifice, that it costs. So when I was at Harding, uh, when my, my sophomore year, I was roommates with Nathan Irwin, and um, at one point, <laughs> Nathan, <coughs> well, I'll, let me tell you this part, part first. I was very uh, generous, as long as it didn't cost me anything. At one point, uh, my friend Kira Kelso came up to me and said, Hey, Jonathan, this weekend my sister is learning how to fly, and her and her flight instructor are going to be landing in Searcy, and he needs a place to stay uh, for on Friday night. And I was like, Yeah, sure, he can stay in, our, in mine and Nathan's dorm room. That's fine. Um, and what Kira didn't tell me was that the flight instructor did not speak any English. He was Italian, and he only spoke Italian. And what I didn't tell Kira, because I had forgotten, was that I was going to be gone that weekend. I was going to go out to a country church, and I was preaching that whole weekend. And I just totally forgot to tell Nathan, my roommate, what I had promised we were going to do. So around midnight on a Friday, this guy shows up. He knows our dorm room number. He knocks on our door, and he says three words to Nathan when Nathan opens the door. He says, me, bed, Jonathan. So Nathan's like, come on in. And he spends the weekend with a guy who speaks no English whatsoever. And when I get back, Nathan's like, hey, I'm fine if you want to be uh, you know, the cheerful giver. But you should be in the room with me if you're going to keep giving away these, you know, like our bedroom. I've always been inspired by stories like this, of people being generous. But it is hard to sacrifice yourself, isn't it? It's hard for you to get skin in the game. But, and this is the point I want you to take, it, take home with you. This changes everything. Do you know why Jesus goes to the cross? Do you know why Jesus is willing to sacrifice? The author of Hebrews tells us the reason Jesus goes to the cross is for the what? For the joy set before Him. Jesus is headed to the cross, even though it's gonna, hurt, even though it's painful, even though it hurts, even though there's, it's gonna, it's gonna be very difficult and full of sacrifice. Jesus does what he does for joy. See, Jesus says, uh, the Gospel of Mark when it tells a rich man story, it says, Jesus looked at this man and loved him. 
Jesus says one thing you lack. He's trying to give this guy something here. He's trying to give you something here. He's not trying to take your money away. He's trying to give you joy. It's because Jesus wants what's best for him and what's best for us. I like the way one theologian, Frederick Beekner, says this. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness, your deep joy, and the world's deep hunger meet. So yeah, Jesus doesn't call everybody to do this. Just this guy. And it's interesting, Jesus says, one thing you lack. He's trying to give this guy something that only this can give him. And because he can't see it, he walks away sad. Now, when Luke tells this story, he does something interesting. Because just on the same page in my Bible, just a couple of verses later, he tells another story. He uses the same word, chief rich person, to describe another rich guy. A wee little rich guy. The rich young ruler would have been a respected person in his community, but Zacchaeus is a tax collector. And he's not popular at all. He's gotten rich off the misery of his fellow man. But Luke is connecting these stories because he wants you to see something. The rich young ruler meets Jesus and he walks away with all his finances intact, but he walks away sad. But I want you to see how Zacchaeus meets Jesus. In Luke 19... Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, a sentiment I can relate to, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus gladly. When it says that, when Zacchaeus says that he was going to um, pay back four times if he robbed anybody, which by the way, he had robbed people. And in his profession, he had robbed people. When he says, I'll pay four times the amount, he's, it's a direct quote to Exodus 22. Zacchaeus is saying there, I'm going to be a Torah following Jewish person again. I'm going to go back to being a part of the people of God. But what I want you to see is that Zacchaeus' net worth has taken a huge hit, right? I mean, all of a sudden, he's, he's, He's lost a ton of money and he welcomes Jesus gladly. You cannot picture this story without smiling. This is what Jesus is after when he's talking about your money. It's not about what God wants from you. It's about something God wants for you. The the best uh, parable of generosity that I know, story of generosity I know for us to just keep front and center every time the collection baskets are passed or every time there's an opportunity to give is this. It's the story of the little boy with the five loaves and the two fishes who shows up and there's 5,000 people there that are hungry. And Jesus takes what little he has and multiplies it to feed the multitudes. Do you think ever in that boy's life, for the rest of his life, do you think he ever looked back on that and said, that was a mistake? Those were my loaves and fishes. No! He gave what little he had and the rest was, he got to watch what God could do with it. See, this is not about money. That's the mistake we make. It is not about money. It is the, it's about being the best possible way to live. So, a few years ago, like over 10 years ago, Leslie and I are with, uh, uh, there's this couple that mentored us when we lived in Fort Worth. And I'm having lunch with him. He's this older guy who we just think the world of. And what we did not know is that they were very, very, rich. We didn't know that they had bought and sold businesses all along the way, but they lived in a um, middle, lower middle class home. They drove old cars. And at one point, I'm having lunch with him, and he tells me about some of the investments that he's made. And he says that somewhere in the next few years, he's going to get a return on investments somewhere between 40 and 80 million dollars. And I was like, lunch is on this guy. And I'll like a dessert, please. And then he tells me, my dream before I die, and he's got this huge smile on his face, 
is to give every penny away. So uh, one of the ministers of the church I used to work at in Fort Worth, uh, about 10 years ago, they were driving along in a little town in West Texas, and their car broke down. So they had to stay and wait for their car to get fixed. And they, as they were at this um, uh, town, they went to a diner, and they were um, being served by this waiter. And they overheard this waiter telling someone else that his car had also broken down. And that he didn't know how he was going to get around. He didn't know how he was going to make ends meet because he just did not have the money to fix his car. And so when he came back over to give him a refill or something, these, uh, this couple, they said, listen, we're followers of Jesus and we don't normally do this, but we're going to give you a really good tip because we think God wants us to do that. And so when the bill comes, the guy notices on the check they wrote that there is the amount for the food plus $500. And the waiter breaks down in the restaurant and starts to cry. So much so that the manager has to come over to be like, is everything okay? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's everything. everything's okay. Because he had never gotten a tip like that before. So one of my first weeks of being here, a lot of y'all saw the video, or maybe you participated in um, Kim Doremus. She's this single woman who has a real heart for fostering. She's adopted already, and she just she was fostering um, a, a, a couple of other kids on top of that. She didn't. She had this car that couldn't fit all her family. And then all of a sudden, on one Sunday morning, a white, a new white minivan pulls into the parking lot slowly as Kim begins to watch and realizes that the reason it was plastered with balloons was because some families and small groups at this church believed enough in her ministry that they wanted to give her a van. And I don't know who did that. I don't know who participated in that, but I'll tell you this. You'll buy a lot of cars in your life and you will never remember one like the way you'll remember that one. As this van slowly comes into the parking lot and Kim, it dawns on her, her church family believes in her and her ministry enough to just buy her a car like you do. A lot of y'all remember when Hurricane Ike hit the southern coast. Well, one of the churches there, uh, First Colony Church of Christ in Houston, was devastated. Their building was wiped out. They had been a really missions-minded church for a long time. And when... Um, a group of Christians in Mbara, Africa, one of the places, their mission points, when they heard about the devastation that had happened to their church, these group of, this group of Christians in Mbara, Africa took a second donation and they sent back to America $21.96. And the minister, Ronnie Norman, said it was the most beautiful and generous gift that our church had ever received. It actually inspired a huge wave of generosity. I have a friend who, uh, right out of college, learned about this thing called microfinancing, which is where it's an economic theory that's actually served to work really well in develop developing countries. It's where um, you'll go to a village in a developing country, and you'll go to a woman in that village because they tend to be more responsible with uh, money in villages, and they will give them a loan of $25. It's a micro loan. But with that, she can start her business and that can help other people uh, in that village. And the guy who de developed this theory found, not only is it, is it wildly successful, but also when they would give the women in the village this loan, the same thing would happen almost every time. When the woman would hold the money for the first time, like $25, her hands would start to shake. And she might pass out or throw up because she knows She's never held any, anything like this in her life. And she knows this can change not just her life, but her village's life. And my buddy, as soon as he got out of college, went all in on doing that. And he loves it. He's doing it not because of some duty, but for the joy set before him. Can you see what's happening here? Can you see what Jesus is inviting you to? This is not just about biting down and giving more. It's about what God is trying to invite us into doing. It's about not letting the stuff that we own be stuff that owns us. That's why when God prompts you to give, you need to do it. This is not about giving more to PV. But when God prompts you to give, you need to do it. Because if you don't, let me tell you, you miss out. And the kingdom of God just goes on. 
You know, we don't know what happened to that rich young ruler, but I can take a guess. I bet he stayed up with Jesus' ministry. I bet he kept listening to what happened. And I bet a few months later when he hears about Jesus being arrested, I bet his heart sank. I bet when he hears that Jesus is sentenced to be crucified, I bet he was sad as he watched it all from a distance. I bet when Jesus, when he hears about Jesus' death, death, he's sad. And then three days later, when the mysterious news starts to get all around Jerusalem, when he hears about how Jesus was raised from the dead, what's he thinking then? A few weeks later, when the Holy Spirit falls and thousands of people are baptized into this new Jesus movement, as he's around just listening to all these stories, what's he thinking then? I bet he thinks something like this. I missed it. I could have been right in the middle of this whole thing. I could have been one of Jesus' main men. People, parents, for thousands of years might have named their kids after this guy. He could have been Peter and Paul and James and Gary or whatever his name is. But you don't know what his name is, do you? The only thing you know about him is what he let define him. His wealth. Every, how many Zacks are, are there? How many Zacks do you know? Zacchaeus, this guy who gave away just about everything. He's even got a song. It's not very flattering, but it's a song. And you don't even know the rich young ruler's name. This guy could have gone on the greatest adventure of his life, and he missed it. And that brings me back to Richard Cerns, that CEO of that fine dining company in North, the Northeast. Right before he hung up the phone after telling him no, the guy who called said, Richard, I just want you to pray about this one question. What if there are people in the world who will die that wouldn't die if you took this job? And he couldn't shake that question. It haunted him. And so eventually, even though it was going to be like 10% of the income he previously had, even though it was just a portion of his salary, he calls World Vision back and says, I'll do it. And he moves his family across the country at this huge you know, pay cut, gives up his home, gives up his private education, gives it all up. And about a year later, he's in Argentina on a survey trip walking through this developing country. And he's going up a hill when a woman runs up to him and she tells him, I have to tell you this story. About a year ago, about 18 months ago, my husband went into $300 worth of debt, which is an insurmountable amount of debt. He bought a lot of sheep to help us start a business. And then my husband, had it, he died suddenly. And to make matters worse, these sheep have contracted a mysterious illness and keep dying. And every time I bury one of these sheep, I know I'm burying my little family as well. And so, about a year ago, I started praying for God to do something to save my family. And mister, I don't know you, but when I saw you, I had a hunch. You were the answers to my prayer. <laughs> and that's when God told Richard Stearns, by the way, if you want to hear the voice of God, ask him about your money. He almost speaks out loud. That's when God told Richard Stearns, you could have missed this. You, you could have missed out on this, but you didn't. You were obedient, and my gift back to you is that you got to be the answer to her prayer. Do you see? The question is, whether or not, is not whether or not you can give more. The question is, can you see it? Can you see what God is offering? This is not the next trendy thing. This is unbridled joy. You're going to walk out those doors this morning into a world that promises you joy with a thousand different opportunities, but they're lying. You can, you, they're saying you can you know, get joy by consuming the next thing, by chasing after the next thing, by buying the next thing, but can you hear the kingdom of God whispering that true joy is found in the last place you would expect? Not by consuming, but by being generous. And my friend said... My dream before I die is to give every penny away. And he couldn't stop smiling. And the waiter breaks down in tears because no one had ever done something like this before. And the van slowly comes into the parking lot as the young foster mom realizes this church believes 
in her ministry. And the group of African Christians write a check for $21 and they found it was the most beautiful and generous gift they had ever received. And the woman's hand starts to shake as she realizes what this gift can do for her village. And God told the ex-CEO, you are the answer to her prayers. This is what it's about. It is not that you would have less Christian. It's that you would find more. My prayer for us, church, is not that we would be poor, but that we would be rich where it counts. I'd like to invite the shepherds to take their places in the aisles. And if there's anything going on in your life, if you would like the prayers of these godly men, they're going to be here. They would love to pray for you while together we stand and worship.